So in Ephesians chapter 1, we're looking at verses 11 to the beginning of verse 13. Now, just to make things a little more complicated, I want you to notice that in the NIV that we have in front of us, the opening phrase of verse 11, in him we were also chosen, has at the bottom of the page in small italics, the very bottom line in the middle, an alternative translation. Or it says, were made as in him, we were made as. And that's the better translation. And that's the translation we're going to use. Rather than in him, we were also chosen. <coughs> so, in him, <coughs> we were made heirs, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. <clears throat> As Paul thanks God for his grace to all who trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, he's looked at the past. He's spoken about the source of that salvation is found in a decision made by God before the foundation of the world. He's then moved on to talk about the present, speaking of how, by God's grace in Christ, we have redemption and forgiveness of our sins, and also, as we saw this morning, are granted all wisdom and understanding, having been introduced to the mystery of God's purposes, that he will unite all things in Christ. The past origins of our salvation, the present blessings of our salvation, and now, in these verses, he's moving on to the future. The future inheritance. He speaks in these verses of a guaranteed inheritance all believers have in Christ. Their eternal salvation includes sharing in Christ's own inheritance in the fullness of God's kingdom. And that's why we read earlier from Romans 8, verses 16 and 17 there said, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Paul is going to go on, and we'll be looking at this Wednesday night, God willing, to show how the Holy Spirit's indwelling of all believers is the down payment of the full inheritance to come. But we're going to concentrate tonight on verses 11 through to verse 13 and marvel at the greatness of God's grace in granting us this inheritance. I don't know if you have a great aunt, but let's pretend we have 
great aunt, well, let's call her Gwen. And great aunt Gwen is a lovely old lady. And uh, she never married. And she's not got any children, consequently. But she's quite well off. She's got a large home which is worth a penny or two. Now you're struggling. You're keeping your head above water, but it's, it's a bit of a daily struggle. And then you hear that great Aunt Gwen, dear as she is, has left everything to you in her will. All of a sudden, your life is transformed. She's still alive, so you haven't got it yet, but you now know that your future is secure because of the inheritance that will be yours one day. All of a sudden, all of your money worries pass away. All of your anxieties for the future of your family are dispelled. The future prospect of the inheritance from great Aunt Gwen profoundly changes your attitude to life. Well, the Christian is assured of sharing in the unlimited spiritual riches of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that brings eternal security and peace of mind as we are insured of a glorious future. And that prospect profoundly affects the way we live day by day. And that's what we want to consider in these verses. First of all, an inheritance obtained in Christ. Paul tells us in verse 11 that that inheritance is in him, that is, in Christ Jesus. The only way anyone has a portion in this inheritance is by being united to Jesus Christ through faith. God, in his loving kindness, bestows many blessings upon all men. In Matthew 5, verse 45, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, For he, that's God, makes his son rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God is good to all men, bestowing physical blessings on them. But the spiritual blessings of his saving grace, he gives only to those who are one with Jesus Christ. It is those for whom Christ died who share in his glorious inheritance. Through his death for sin and his resurrection, victory over death, they have a place in heaven and they will share in Christ's perfect holy nature and the fullness of his inheritance. And the second thing that Paul says in verse 11 is that future inheritance is so certain it's already theirs. That opening phrase uh, is, has a particular tense. It's a tense that was used 
to describe something in the future that's so certain it's spoken of as already happened. It's in the future, but it's so certain it's spoken of as if it's already happened. Dear Aunt, Great Aunt Gwen, she may change her mind. You may upset her. You may forget her birthday. And in a fit of uh, rage, she might change her will. So you can never be 100% certain. But it's not like that with the inheritance that the Christian has in Christ. It is impossible for the Christian not to receive that inheritance. Because it's spoken of as something they've already obtained. If we were to use a modern phrase, we could say, it's already in the bank. This is no vague promise, which may or may not be kept. It is certain that all believers in Jesus Christ will receive the inheritance, and it's spoken of as already being in their possession. Paul is so excited by the blessings God gives to Christians. Redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, insight. And on top of all of that, an even greater weight of eternal riches to come. The Christian has so much to be thankful for now and even more to look forward to. Now, I'm told that the point of the mighty Amazon, point of origin of the mighty Amazon River, is a trickle of water coming off a cliff high in the Peruvian Andes. They say it's a beautiful location. And from that spot, the river begins its 3,900 mile journey to the ocean. And what starts as a trickle soon becomes a mighty river that ships can navigate for almost its entire length. At times, the Amazon is up to 30 miles wide before merging with the Atlantic Ocean. What starts as a trickle grows and grows and grows to become a mighty flood. And similarly, the blessings that flow from Calvary become a flood of God's grace which eventually expands into the vast, eternal riches of his people's inheritance in glory. Now many people dread the future. Perhaps they fear a slow decline in their health as life slips away. But you know, the Christian should have the opposite view. The older they get, the closer they are to the fullness of the blessings that are theirs in Christ. You see, the Christian is never about decline. For the Christian, it's always about progress. Progress in God's grace and progress towards 
the fullness of Christ's inheritance. We have an abundance of blessing now, but we can't even begin to imagine the glorious inheritance that awaits us. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, But it is written, What no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. So what joy should be ours as we see the glory that's before us? The day will come when we will see our Lord and Saviour in all of his beauty, in all of his splendour and majesty. And we will be like him. And we will share in his inheritance. All things are given to him by the Father in heaven and on earth. And we will share that inheritance with him. Now that glorious future is only for those who have Jesus Christ as their saviour. Any who have not repented of their sin and trusted in Christ's death on the cross for forgiveness, well, they can only look forward to judgment and damnation. And there is nothing as stark as the contrast between the future state of the believer and the unbeliever. Heaven and hell are so diametrically different. And if people want to share in the glory of Christ's inheritance, they must come to faith in him. Well, Paul goes on that this is a God given inheritance. This glorious inheritance is bequeathed to Christians by our Heavenly Father, whose promises are always fulfilled. Now, as fathers, some of us have made promises to our children on occasions, which we sincerely intended only to find that uh, we were not able to keep them for whatever reasons. And we've had to apologize and say, we're sorry that we couldn't keep our promise. But that's never true with our Heavenly Father. He is almighty. And there is nothing that can thwart his will. And he is omniscient. He knows everything. So there is nothing that can unexpectedly crop up and cause him not to keep his promise. And we should note then three things in these verses. First, their inheritance is given because God freely chooses to do it. Look there at verse 11, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything. Every recipient of this inheritance is an unworthy sinner who deserves only God's condemnation. But instead, God determines to give them eternal riches beyond all imagination. And, verse 11 goes on to say, it is assured by God's sovereign power who works out everything 
in conformity with the purpose of his will. And the word work there works out everything is any jail from which you will have worked out straight away. We get our word energy or energize or energetic. And it speaks of the divine power which creates and sustains everything. The irresistible power of God. And it is that power which delivers the inheritance to all who trust in Christ as their Savior. And then Paul adds God's purpose in doing this. Verse 13. That this is to the praise of God. Sorry, not verse 13. With the purpose of his will. God grants us eternal riches. Not only for our good, but to demonstrate his glory. Have you got a, a display cabinet at home? And you've got all of your best pieces of china there. And you want everybody to see them. You haven't hidden them away in a drawer or a cupboard. You want people to take notice. Well, as we've said before, God's purpose is to put us on display for his glory and for the whole of creation to look at the greatness of the inheritance that he bestows upon us and to have its breath taken away and to say, wow, look what God has done for those people. They deserve nothing except his condemnation. But instead, he has given them an inheritance as his children, equal to the inheritance of his beloved son. The glorious inheritance that awaits every believer is sure and certain because it is freely promised by the sovereign God whose power always accomplishes his will to the fulfillment of his wishes. You see, our expectation of this inheritance is not wishful thinking. It is the assured outcome of God's gracious giving of all things in Christ Jesus, his Son. Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own Son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You know the plot. You've seen it a number of times on television programs and films. A family gathers at a solicitor's office for the reading of the will of a deceased relative. Each one arrives with an expectation of sharing in the inheritance. And then the solicitor reads out that the deceased has left everything to the local dog's home. And everybody in the room suddenly a crestfallen. All their hopes have gone. Their disappointment soon turns to anger and recrimination. Their expectation has been smashed. The look of horrified disappointments 
the longed for inheritance has been denied them at the very last. Now, as Christians, we know we are unworthy of any inheritance. But yet we are absolutely assured God will faithfully keep his promise to grant us all things in Christ. And this glorious inheritance laid up for us in heaven is all down to God's sovereign grace. In this world, people talk about self-made men and women, and they're often admired. But you know, in heaven, there will only be God-made inheritors of the riches which are in Christ Jesus. We will not have contributed to receiving that inheritance. There will be nothing that we have done which will be the cause of God granting to us the inheritance. It will all be because God has chosen to give us the inheritance, not because of what we are, in fact, despite what we are, but because of who Christ is and all that he has done. One of the greatest causes for rejoicing will be that the inheritance is ours because Christ secured it for us that the inheritance will be all the more precious to us, will be all the more glorious, because it is ours through Christ's death on the cross. It's rightfully his and his alone. But yet, we have a portion in it. That's why in heaven the focus will not be upon the ones who receive the inheritance, but the one who earned it, the Lord Jesus Christ. The inheritance is assured because of the character of the one who's promised it. It comes from the God who never breaks his word, knows how unworthy we are, yet will never withdraw his promise, and is all-powerful so that nothing can change his purpose. We are certain of glory, of the inheritance, because we know God's promises are never, ever withdrawn. That's the future. The future. And it's an inheritance for all, we're told. Paul speaks of two groups of people in verses 12 and 13. He first of all speaks about himself and others with him who were the first to hope in Christ. That refers to Jewish believers who along with the apostles, including Paul, with the beginnings of the Church of Christ. But then in verse 13, Paul refers to you also, to the members of this church in Ephesus, who were Gentiles. Later in the letter, Paul's going to emphasize that both Jews and Gentiles are included in Christ on exactly the same terms. 
from verse 11 of chapter 2 to verse 13 of chapter 3. And consequently, as much as Jewish believers, verse 6 of chapter 3 says, the Gentiles also are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. In Christ all are equally blessed in the eternal inheritance of his riches. Each believer has been chosen, redeemed, forgiven in Christ. All have the same saving faith. And therefore all share equally in Christ's inheritance. Partaking in the inheritance is based solely and entirely on God's grace. And therefore, nobody has a greater claim to that inheritance or a greater share in that inheritance than any other believer. There was no greater division in New Testament times than that between Jew and Gentile. But in Christ, the two are united in perfect unity and equality. The inheritance is for all believers, and all believers share equally in the inheritance. Our different cultures have different views on who inherits uh, family wealth in the West. We normally think of the remaining spouse retaining everything. And then on their death, the estate being shared equally amongst any children. But in many countries of the world, things are different. And particularly in more Eastern cultures, often when the father dies, all of the family's possession passes immediately to the eldest son, not to the mother. And he retains full control over all the assets. But he is also responsible for his mother, for his siblings, and their families. He gets everything, but he also gets the responsibility to care financially and in every way for every member of the family. Now Jesus Christ deserves the full inheritance of God's riches, but he has willingly taken upon himself the responsibility for everyone in God's family. For you, for me, for all our brothers and sisters in every part of the world and in all of history. He takes full responsibility for our eternal blessing and therefore gives each one of us a full share in his Father's riches. There are no first or second class citizens in God's kingdom, either in this world or in the next. In heaven, one of the great blessings is that there is absolute uh, unity, equality, and harmony amongst all Christ's brethren as they worship God. And that being so, do not fear you will miss out. Do not fear that you will be the one who will miss out on any of the blessings of heaven because of your failures. Perhaps you think sometimes, you look at others and say, oh, 
I'm such a poor Christian compared to them. Look at all of my failings. Surely, I, I can't have an equal portion in the inheritance with them. And I fail the Lord so often. I, I, I must be in danger in losing out. On a part, if not all of the inheritance. No. 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 We are all failures when it comes to our Christian walk. None of us are perfect. Some of us, our failures have been more public than others. But we all are not worthy of the inheritance that is laid up for us in heaven. It's ours because of Christ. And he will never leave or forsake us. And the Father will never turn us away. It's for us all, equally. But there's another danger, going to the other extreme. We can look at other Christians and say, you know, I'm better than them. Well, we wouldn't say it, but we'd think it. And we look down our noses at them and say, I'm far more regular in the prayer meeting than he is or she is. And I'm far more committed to the church than they are. And I'm better in evangelism than they're. And therefore, I must surely be a little bit more worthy of the inheritance. And again, the answer to that is no. 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 For none of us are worthy. But the inheritance is ours because of God's grace in Christ. And so we praise God that this gracious inheritance is granted to all his people. Every believer has the assurance of sharing in the inheritance of Christ's riches by God's grace. God has promised it and it will be so. It cannot be any other than this. That we, by being united to Christ through faith, have bestowed upon us the glorious inheritance that Christ secured by his death upon the cross and none of us will miss out because Christ has ensured the inheritance is ours. So let's rejoice in our inheritance. If we had a great Aunt Gwen who was going to leave us everything, well, we'd be happy, wouldn't we? We'd be glad. We'd probably be telling a few people as well. And we would be making our plans on how we would spend the loot when it gets to us. Well, we have a gracious, glorious inheritance. We are joint heirs 
with Christ. We should tell everyone about that. And we should live in the light of that glorious inheritance to come by living to the praise of God as we rejoice in our salvation. May God then be praised for his great goodness to us in Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen.